Welcome everybody to our ninth lecture. My goodness, we're more than halfway through the semester for E340-542, uh, Dynamics on Networks. And today we're going to be talking about a little bit of antimony coding, uh, simple things, and then also reviewing some homework problems, and then I hope getting towards speed forward networks. And uh, we're going to be concentrating around chapters 12, 13, and then the feed forward network is a chapter in its own in Herbert's book. Um, so that's something that you might want to look at. And the class as usual is live streamed and recorded. So I want to go through uh, three of the homework problems. Um, we talked a little bit about the first one uh, in uh, the other day. And then I want to just mention time-dependent functions and antimony. Uh, we'll do maybe one or two quick exercises with those, uh, specifying ODEs and antimony. People may have already done this, but it's, uh, I'll remind people quickly. And then we'll jump into feed-forward networks. And those can be dug in uh, a lot or done in sort of a superficial way. Um, my slide decks were very long for them because Herbert digs into a lot of detail. Uh, I don't think we need all of that detail, but the slides will be there. They'll be hidden, so you won't see them today. But if you go into the deck, it's shared. Uh, you, could, you could, if you want all the detail, it's there, all the math. Is there. So I wanna just review last time, uh, we really spent two classes talking about questions we can ask, qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative questions and the idea of trying to build phase diagrams that define uh, what behaviors happen and what their spatial or, or topological relationships are. And I think one thing to remember, if there's one takeaway from the discussion the other day, it's that while you don't expect the exact positions of boundaries between domains to be correct for a, a model, uh, you would like the domains themselves to be right. In other words, if it says there's a steady state and oscillating chaotic region in the model, there should be a steady state oscillating chaotic region in the experiment. And the general relationship should be that way. Uh, in general, in biology, pure quantitative questions are hard. Uh, Semi-quantitative and qualitative questions are easier to ask experimentally. And then we did events and we played with events and we discovered that you can actually build rather complex control using events. Um, and uh, it's, it's a challenge to think about how biological systems organize uh, because you don't have the kind of linear control we're used to in, in computing. And so building an organism uh, is, is a hard problem because there are no blueprints and there are no plans. And so building organisms from the inside out with local information is fundamentally a very difficult problem. Events aren't the, the answer to that, but they're one small piece of what we could think of. So I'd like to come back to the homework. And the homework problem was based on a problem in Herbert's chapter, early chapters, chapter one or two, uh, where he showed some motifs. And Herbert's textbook, one perhaps weakness of it is that it doesn't go into a lot of motifs. It does a few, uh, but textbooks like Uri Alon's textbook and some of the other ones go into a lot more detail about uh, fundamental biological motifs. You see the same kinds of patterns of uh, interactions, both in gene regulatory and signaling networks again and again. Now these kinds of simple patterns are called motifs. And there's a lot of work that's been done to understand both the steady state behavior of these systems, their stability, their bifurcations, that is changes of their steady state uh, and their stability, and then also their temporal behavior. And most of the dynamical systems analysis that we do is concerned with steady states. Um, and so when we get to the feed forward network, we're gonna be dealing with uh, dynamics. Uh, and uh, that's a little bit more challenging. So the, we had uh, five examples in the homework. It was a long homework problem. And there were a series of questions 
Now, the first one was display a time series of A and B that I don't think anybody had any trouble with. The second one was doing parameter scans over the initial values of A and B. Um, and one question that you have to ask when you do that is do you, do you scan both at once? And some people had nice heat maps of the steady states but as a function of A and B, which was great. Uh, or do you um, do something else? And this is uh, particularly uh, interesting in the case of C, which is the one of these that's actually probably the most interesting. Um, and then it was a question of what are the dependencies of the steady states on the parameters, so parameter scan. And again, you have many parameters simultaneously. So the question is what do you do about the ones you're not scanning? And then the question about upward and downward pulses. And uh, some people had no problem with this and did all of it. As I say, it's long. Uh, some people uh, found some of it challenging, which is normal. And I wanted to go through uh, examples of all of this uh, to think about how it works. And uh, to do that, I built this, uh, this notebook and you'll find that there's some things in the notebook that are not germane because I didn't have time to clean it up. I was adding things to it till the last minute. Uh, but it does have the basic things that we're going to need uh, to do the analysis to answer these questions. And so I'd like to start out with the autocatalysis problem, which is the first one. This seems like a trivial system. Uh, uh, a chemical promotes itself. And the reason that this is the simplest, iter you could say the simplest iterative system that you can have is that it exhibits what's called bistability. Um, if A is small, A stays small. If A is large, it goes to a higher steady state. So there are two steady states. Uh, and you'll find that uh, two things happen. And I'm saying the answer because we've already done the problem. Uh, in the first place, depending on the initial value of A, you go to different steady state. Uh, in the second place, uh, if you change the values of B, K1 or K2, you'll find you can go from a situation in which only the low value steady state is stable the one where you have two steady states that are both stable, to one where only the high steady state is stable. And so there is parameter scan interest in that. And of course, if you have two steady states, then the pulse uh, can potentially knock you between the two steady states. And there's some interest in knowing how big does the pulse have to be to push you between the two steady states. So, let me, let me now um, ask people, I'd like everybody to fire up Tellurium, and I would like you to op upload and uh, launch that um, homework problem package that I have. And I'm going to switch to showing you my version of it, but I'd like people to try running it on their own before I show you the results. If that's okay. And if anybody has trouble finding the home, the, 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 that, uh, that, that uh, notebook or downloading it and uploading it again, please do let me know so I can help out. I have a question. Isn't that one the code for the B and not the A? Is that, is that correct? Model B, not model A? I, I think so, yeah. Oh, so did I did I... I could be wrong, but I think if I'm remembering the same thing as Joel, I think the A was the one that inhibits itself. All right. All right. Um, so we're, we're not doing the A. We're doing okay. three of the five. Um, the and the, the self-inhibition one is not so interesting. Self-inhibition, you get a single steady state, a single stable steady state. Um, and so... In a sense, maybe it's a, it's a little bit surprising. You might think that if you've done a lot of dynamical systems, people, you, you, you have a prejudice that inhibitors are less stable than, than, than activators. And therefore, 
you'd ex might expect to have bistability with inhibition, but in this case, it's not. So does anybody need uh, the link to that document again? Does everybody have it? And I ask your indulgence a little bit because I did not clean this up to be beautiful. The code could be cleaned up, documented better. But I wanted to show the base. And the first cell is the one that, that will do what you want, at least the beginning. Of it. And one thing you may find is that uh, in general, I tried to respect the parameter values that were in the original assignment, but occasionally, I switched to other parameter values that I thought worked better in the in the notebook. So that's one thing you can. So why don't I give people a few minutes? We could maybe just I could I could do use I, I haven't been using those polls very much, but I'll do the exercise completion poll. Just let me know let me know when you've got the uh, the notebook up and running. But I do want everybody to do this. I really, this is. I think it's important that everybody. And with this first one, I probably will walk you through it with my results. And for the other ones, I may ask you to show me your results rather than uh, rather than having me uh, having me uh, having me do it all. Does anybody want to tell me what they got in terms of the time series? I already told you the answer, but what did you see? Somebody. I mean, we have uh, basically a bunch of initial conditions for the trajectories, and we see them converging on two points. Um, and then just general, I don't know if this is the type of detail you want to get into, but just like intuitively, we know that there should be an unstable point um, separating those two things. Yeah, if you, and, and always with these, with the numerical things for instability, um, if you, if you, um, if you start on the unstable point, you should stay on it. But of course, that means you analytically have to know what it is, or you have to be lucky. Um, Herbert makes the suggestion that you could run time backwards by changing the sign of the differential equations. And that generally is a recipe for disaster. But if you know approximately where the the uh, approximately where the unstable fixed point is, then uh, it should work. So maybe that's actually a little exercise we can try in class now with this example, which is if you start very near the place you think the unstable fixed point is, change the sign of the uh, of the uh, evolution equations. Uh, does it, in fact, give you the unstable fixed point? For people who haven't done any dynamical systems, the terminology may be uh, not as clear, and we'll come back to what explaining it more. 
and do feel free to ask for definitions. Finding unstable fixed points is one of the things that uh, either a program like Mathematica, if you're willing to use commercial software, or XPP Aut, uh, if you want to stay open source, is particularly good at. I try in this class to not have you use any, require you to use any software except uh, Tellurium and but uh, XPP Aut is, is pretty and it's fast to learn. Developed by Bart Ehrman and Pitt. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so does anybody have a result on the steady state dependence on key parameters that they think is interesting? What would you expect? Uh, let's just take B as an example. If B is very large, what would you expect? Maybe it's worth starting with these parameters that we have. So let's look at this one, the first one. Here's the time series. And we see that there's a range, uh, if I start above about, eight, in this case, I come to a high value. And if I start between zero and seven point something, I come to this lower value. So uh, I have two steady states, stable steady states, for these parameters. Why do I have two stable steady states? What does this hill function look like? This hill function determines how much, how fast A grows. And if the value of A is small, the value of this hill function is small. So if the value of A means that this hill function is small compared to the dissipation rate, K2, then I'm never going to be able to accumulate a lot of A. I'm getting rid of A faster than I'm gaining A. And you can figure this out analytically if you like. It's only a few lines. Uh, simply setting the value here to zero uh, and finding uh, there's the intermediate fixed point, which is not so high. Okay, Connor says you got it. How did you get it, Connor? The thing you said was a disaster. I was just really careful. So, so. Maybe, maybe you could just tell me what I would have to do. I have to start with an initial value. Let me just yeah. look here. If I so, look here, here the, 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 the unstable fixed point is around eight. Yeah, so I, I scanned from five to 10 just to get a little bit of a range. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just changed my rates in the antimony model to, be, to both be negative for the right-hand side. Um, okay, and that seemed see. to do it. Okay, let's give it a name like RR unstable. And we will change the sign of everything. And I know that if I make, uh, if I'm in particular, minus K2A is exponential growth. So that one, that one is intrinsically very unstable. That's why I was trying to be really careful to only place initial conditions where it would be wedged between the previously stable yeah. fixed points. So let's let's start now um, with this say between six point five and eight. Okay. Like one, and we'll do unstable. Was that more or less what you did? 
Yeah, that's pretty much what I did. Okay, let's see what happens. Um, why is it showing me? Okay. Yes, it worked. Yep. And that's more or less how the, the, the software that finds unstable fixed points does it. Um, so yes, I can actually find the unstable fixed point if I want this way. Um, for people who are, again, for people who haven't done dynamical systems, this may seem obscure, uh, but what we're trying to say is this. If I look at my picture here, for large values of A, initially, I go to this higher value. For smaller values of A, I go this lower value. Somewhere in the middle, there's a boundary between the points that go up and the points that go down. I see that here in this line that takes a long time to get there, because that means I'm starting very close to the point that's uh, an unstable fixed point. If I start exactly in the middle here, I'd stay at that middle point forever. The problem is, finding it, because if I go even a little bit away from it, I'll eventually move off of it as I did here on this line or this line. The trick that you can use is that if you're moving away from it going forward in time, you're moving towards it going backward in time. And so if I started say on this line here, this green line and run that backward in time, it comes to that middle point. So that's great. The problem is that if I started up here and run backward in time, my value goes to infinity. If I started down here, my value goes to zero. And so I have to be close enough, what's called the basin of attraction of that point, to be able to find it. So in principle, as long as I'm between my two stable fixed points, I should be okay. In practice, it's a little bit harder though. So actually finding that unstable fixed point this way is, is not bad. Herbert says, don't bother to change the sign. Just put the time in the simulate command, say simulate from 100 to zero and see what happens. It doesn't work. Maybe an older version of Tellurium let you do that, but the current version tells, throws an error. But you can reverse time easily enough just by putting a minus sign in front of all your rate ones. Okay. So that was that. We found our unstable fixed point. And now we can do the perturbations. And the perturbations here are not uh, perhaps that exciting. But here I've started with the low steady state. And I've tried perturbing downwards and upwards. And I've seen what happened. And I've put in a little bit of a delay so that they're not all on top of each other so you can see them. And what you see is that if I go down a little bit or up a little bit, I come back, which is telling me the steady state is stable. That's what stability means. I go a little bit away from it, I come back. But of course, if I go high enough and I go above that threshold, that unstable fixed point, I'm now going to do what I saw up here which is start moving up to that top level. And so in this case, if I'm sitting for a low value of A and I throw some A onto it, if I throw enough A onto it, I'll switch to the high value. Similarly, if I start on the high value and take some A away, if I take enough way I, away, I switch to the low value. And so that's the pulse recovery uh, simulation. That I and again, a lot of people did it. Everybody came up with a slightly different way of doing it. There isn't a particular right or wrong way, uh, but this is what I wanted to explore. And in the case of that first one with auto inhibition, it's boring because there's only one steady state. You always come back to where you start. So the next thing, and the order here is a little bit out of order, was the dependence on key parameters. And this is called a bifurcation scan. And again, here I'll walk you through it maybe by hand. And then for the other ones, you can think about a little bit more. So here is the value of B. 
And what I want you to think about is why is there a low steady state? And I explained this before. There's a low steady state because if A is small, this Hill function of A is small, which means that the rate at which I'm creating A is approximately B. The rate at which I'm destroying A is K2 times A. And so the steady state would then be B over K2. That's the low valued steady state. If A is high, then this becomes approximately K1. Suppose A were infinitely large. K1 times A, 10 to the H is just 10 to the H is a constant. If A is bigger than a lot bigger than 10, this is just K1 times A to the H over A to the H is just K1. In which case the left-hand side here is B plus K1. And so the steady state would be B plus K1 over K2 which is the high steady state. But so what happens if B is much bigger than K1? Think about that. Then the two cases that you've outlined are basically the same they both are B over K2. Right. So if B is big, doesn't matter what A is because I'm dominated by the source term B. And in that case, I always go to the high steady state. There is only a high steady state. And I see this happening here. I, uh, I see this happening here as I increase B, I see this relatively sharp switch where my low steady state jumps up and merges in with the high steady state. And so in this case, for small values of B, I have two values of the steady state. For large values of B, I only have one. I only have the high steady state. Now let's think about K2. What's going to happen with K2? If K2 is small, and I started out with it pretty small, I know I have two states. Suppose K2 is big, and we're talking about big now with relationship to B and K1. Suppose B, K2 were 10. K2 controls the rate at which I lose A. The bigger K2 is, the faster A disappears. So what would I expect in my steady states? If I increase K2, my steady state's going to go up or down? We will only go down. The only steady state you have is the low way. Right. And so here, I'm sorry, I jumped, I did, I, they're out of order. Here's K2. K2 is a little bit more interesting because if K2 is very big, I see there's only one steady state, which is the low steady state. I see something else, which is if K2 is very small, I really only have one steady state, which is the high steady state, because making K2 very small is almost is equivalent to making B and K1 very big. So it's only the ratio that matters. And then there's this intermediate region here between about 0.6, say 0 0.06 and about 0.13, where I have both steady states. Now that happens to be for B equal to 0.2 and K1 equal to two and H equals four. If I changed K1, the size of this regime would change. But this is a classic bifurcation diagram. I have a single steady state, the high steady state. As I increase K2, I get two steady states, a high and a low steady state. And then I see the merge again here. What's missing is that intermediate steady state, the unstable one. There should be a dashed line, which represents the unstable steady state, that would go from this point where the blue, blue, the blue and the orange line diverge to the point where they merge again. And, and if I were teaching you stability theory, there's a fundamental result in stability theory that 
uh, steady states never appear by themselves. You always come in, they always appear in pairs. They always appear one steady and one unsteady together. So you go from one steady to one, two steady and one unsteady to one steady, stable. So what would happen here if I change, what happens to this curve here for K2 if I were to change the value of B? Why doesn't somebody try that and tell me what they get? You could make B twice as big or half as big. What happens to this little loop? Does it get bigger or does it get smaller? That would be essentially doing two parameter scan at once. And to display that, you'd need to do a little bit of 3D graphics, which we're not going to do. Why doesn't, why does it, the, the people on the top half of the Zoom call try B equals 0 0.1, people on the bottom half of the Zoom call try B equals 0 0.4, and tell me whether they get a bigger or smaller box. I tried B equals to 1, and that already gave a, a different result. It moved your... Yeah, I moved the orange line uh, towards uh, after 0 0.1, actually. So it's bigger than 0 0.1. And the blue line is is higher for most of the simulation up to, to 0 0.2. OK, let's try that. Let's see if I move. I have to go all the way back. I'm sorry to be scrolling on you here. Let me move. You said here, you said B equal one, to 1.0. No one. I did equal to one. I actually did on the on the code. I just put rr dot b equals to one. Yeah, it's probably better to do it that way so you don't mess up the original. Okay, let's see what happened when I do that. Notice when I met b equal one, I only have the high steady state now. But the other value is the same. Um, my unstable fixed point is still there. My perturbations now don't do anything very exciting because there's only one steady state. And I basically abolished my, my bistable region. I did it. What if I made B2 smaller? Did anybody try 0.1? What did they get? I did 0.05. Question on uh, the current state. Why, if there's only one stable point, why did the graph for the bifurcation scan of B? Oh, never mind. It's uh, B is what. Never mind. Just please continue. No, well, I, 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 I'm quite capable of saying something wrong. So if I, if I miss something, please let me know. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right. So let's come back to that. Did anybody else find anything interesting? I mean, just the opposite if you shrink B, right? The bistable region grows. Okay. So let's see, let's try that. Um, which was the one we were looking at? That was scanning. That's the, the last one, yeah. This one. So let's say RR dot B equals, you said 0 0.05 by 0 0.01. Sure. sure. Okay, these haven't been changed because I didn't. I only changed it in the one. And actually, here even at zero, there are two steady states. So, so I never see the the, the regime where, where there's only one on the lower half. Okay. That is pretty much the full analysis of this problem. Um, and uh, you could, you could, you, there, there are a few things you could do. You could add that unstable steady state line to the graph, which would be nice. You could do a 3D scan where you scan, a 3D plot where you do two parameters at once. But uh, if I were going to ask you to do a, a full analysis of this problem, that would, I think, be. Well, pretty much uh, about as full an analysis as you can do. Um, you could ask questions about what's reasonable for real systems. 
And what that can be sort of interesting is H. If you change the value of H, what happens? I didn't do a parameter scan in H. Let's do a parameter scan in H. Um, we can add that easily enough. Everybody can add that. For some reason, Zoom and my mouse are not getting along. So we have to do some hand. Uh, so we'll set set H equals H. And in this case, we don't want it to be zero. It doesn't make sense. So the smallest we're going to use is one. And H could go up to something pretty big, like 20. We're going to do that. We certainly don't want to step 0.001 and take forever. And we need to change this to H. And actually, it's not H, it's N1 in the, in the, in the code. No, it is H. Okay. And this will be bifurcation scan on H. Again, you could do these things much more elegantly. Suggesting that this is pretty. Uh, let's see, is that right? Scan H. Zero to twenty. Da, 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 simulate reset. Da, 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 da. Uh, result four. Oh, I need to make this result. So what did I do wrong? I'm not sure why it jumps that way. That's a bit of an annoyance. Okay, so here I got nothing. Oh, because I have to take two inside. It's only fair that if I ask you to code on the fly, I should have to code on the fly in front of you and make mistakes too. Okay, so here's H. So you see here, if H is too small, I'm going to find that there's only one steady state and then they split. And so this makes some sense because we depend on the switch-like behavior that there's a big difference between small values of A and large values. There is an interesting case for that in between 12.5 and 10, where you can see the different, like a clear uh, division between blue and orange, low and high. So there, there are a bunch of things one can do. And so you now have you know, simple code, it's nothing very sophisticated, but you can plug in any functions that you, you have to analyze. And you have to do a little bit of hand editing, but this is a script that you could use to play. Okay. Any questions about this one before we move on? Because I think when you're thinking about doing analysis of these kinds of problems, uh, it's important to walk through what, what you can do and what, what might be expected. <laughs> In this case, we only have one variable, one species, which is A. And so there's a limit to how much we can do. The next set become more interesting. And here was just a summary slide of what we saw. Um, the next one is probably the most interesting one, which is the relaxation oscillator, um, where we have auto activation of one species. That species activates a second species. 
and that species in turn comes back and inhibits the first species. And so increasing this one directly increases itself. Indirectly, it increases this, which then inhibits itself. So we have two competing forces. A fundamentally acts to activate itself, and it also acts indirectly to inhibit itself. That's called incoherent signal, which we'll come back to in the feed forward now. The parameter values here are, are the ones that Herbert picked. And I assume that he picked them because they come from some source paper. I, I don't have any idea how you would come up with those on your own. Uh, I normally tend to start with everything equal to one uh, to begin with. And so values of 0 0.45, 0 0.037 are not things that I would typically guess on my own. And so what did people find uh, when they did this? And again, this is in the, in the notebook in the next group. Uh, but one of the things that you have to decide when you're doing a two, a two variable series like this is how you're going to display it. Do you display A and B on the same uh, axis or do you put them on separate ones and so on? Joel, go ahead. Yeah, you're mentioning about how he found those numbers. The only way to do it is by do a parameter scan what we were doing, the way we were doing, and then using the values we find most interest. Is that That's correct? true. The issue here, though, is there are a lot of parameters. So uh, I'd have to at least, I mean, I, I could imagine doing a parameter scan for two parameters at once. Uh, trying to find values for one, two, three, four, five, six, well, five, five parameters is a little harder. In fact, they don't all matter. In other words, rate is the ratios of them that matter. Um, and some of them have been eliminated already. So in the denominator, you see the capital K has been replaced by one. So he's already done some reduction of the complexity of the system. Uh, you can always also uh, change the time scale to get rid of one of the decay constants. So there's one extra parameter here. You could get rid of one of the Ks, K2 or K3. Uh, but then beyond that, you're stuck. So there really are one, one, two, three, four, four independent parameters as well. So what happens with this when you do this as a time series? The people remember what they got? Yeah, you have an oscillation uh, for longer times. So do you always get an oscillation? Mm, I think it's for specifics. Uh, let me open this one, just give me a second. Uh, I think it's for A equal to B bigger than K. You have some oscillation. I mean, all the cases for when A and B is bigger or oh, smaller than K. That's true. But then okay. it changes over time. Like if they're equal, you don't have that. They're equal or close to K that you don't have or bigger yeah. than K you don't have. So, so what we have here, and I think this, you have to jump down to this cell a little bit further down, which has this model. Um, It has at the top the words toggle switch null client and phase portrait, which is not right. Uh, I didn't get it updated yet. Uh, you will see this plot. So I'd ask you to scroll down to this plot. And this plot may, if you're a dynamical systems person, you'll say, oh, I understand this plot. And if you're not a dynamical systems person, you might very well say, wow, well, what's going on? So let me walk you through this plot. Uh, because these kinds of phase portraits uh, are uh, the way that people analyze, especially two-dimensional problems, problems with two variables. Um, and once you learn how to read them, they're pretty, they're pretty useful. But it does take a little bit of getting used to. So what we have here 
on the bottom axis is X, because I didn't relabel it. X is A, species A. And on the Y axis, we have species B. And uh, the reason they're labeled X and Y is because Herbert's template code used X and Y. And I didn't want to have to go through and change the variable names to everything. So you'll have to you'll have to do some mental mapping of X is A and Y is B. And what I've done here, or what Herbert has done, is start with a bunch of different initial conditions for X and Y, and he's run them in time. But instead of plotting them versus time, he's plotted the value of X versus Y. So what one of these lines represents is I started here with x equal with uh, x that is a equal to two and y that is b equal to zero, and I see that the value of a goes up, and the value of b also goes up. And he's used a plot streamline function, which is a matplotlib utility which will actually put little arrows on the line so you can see which direction you're moving. Because one problem of just plotting the locus of points is that you don't know if you're going to the left or to the right. So for all of these initial conditions down here, initial value of A bigger than about a half, initial value of B equal to zero, a increases and B increases. I move up and to the right. And of course, I could have started at any point along these trajectories. I could have started with A equal to six and B equal to three or four, and I'd still move up and to the right. Where things get more interesting is here on the left. Suppose I started with a large value of B, seven, and a value of A equal to 0.1. Then I move down very steeply, and it looks like I'm actually going to wind up at zero, zero comma zero. Let's look at my equations here. Is zero comma zero a steady state for these equations? Besides Joel and Connor today. So if I set A equal to zero, the rate of change of A, the Hill function is zero for A equals zero, and the decay is zero. So dA by dt is zero if A is zero. Similarly for B, the creation of B depends on A. So if there's no A, I get no B. If I have no B, I have no decay. So if A, a is zero and B is zero, then that's a steady state. I don't immediately know whether it's a stable steady state or an unstable steady state. Uh, but in fact, if I see these lines coming down towards it, it's telling me it's a stable steady state. Now, what about this region here around A equals a half, B equals 1.5? What do these trajectories do? I see these trajectories come up. Initially, let's just start here about one half comma one half. I move up and to the right, the way I did if I started out with large value of A, very small value of B. I move up and to the right, but as I keep going, my value of A increase goes down. My value of B increase goes up. Why is that? Well, B inhibits A. So the bigger the value of a, B is, the less I create A. But the more A I have, the more I create B. And at a certain point, I see as B keeps increasing, A goes from increasing, moving to the right, to moving to the left. 
B keeps increasing, but now A is going down. As A goes down, the rate of increase of B will go down. And eventually I get to a point up here around one A equal one, B equals six, where A is decreasing and B stops increasing and starts decreasing. And then in this regime here, B large, A small, I come down again, just the way I did all the way on the left. Now B is decreasing and A is decreasing. As A goes down, the rate of decrease of B, sorry, as, as, B, as, A, as B goes down, the rate of decrease of A slows down. And eventually it's a little bit hard to see somewhere around here about 0.5, comma 1.5, B keeps decreasing, but now A starts increasing again. And so what I see are circles or oval ellipses or some complex oval shit, irregular oval, where I go in circles and that's the oscillation that I see. And so I see three regimes here. If I start out with a much bigger than B, I go to the right, I don't oscillate. If I start out with B much bigger than A, I go to zero and I don't oscillate. And in this intermediate regime between these two, I see oscillations. Now, what are these red and green dots that I've posted here? Those are fixed points. There should also be a fixed point at zero comma zero, and it's there, but it's hard to see because it's cut off by the corner. What are these red lines? These red lines are a very powerful concept that in some ways is very, very simple. And in some ways is people find very confusing. And I, I have to say, I sometimes get confused by it. These red lines are the points at which either dA by dt is zero or dB by dt is zero. A fixed point is when both dA by dt and dB by dt is zero. So by definition, when these lines cross, I have a fixed point. You'll notice that this, and they should probably give them separate color, the red line that I'm pointing at with my curtain, with my mouse, is where dA by dt is zero. The line is vertical. The trajectories are vertical. When I cross that line, I go from A increasing to A decreasing. The other line, this one to the left of it, is where dB by dt is zero. When I cross that line, I go from B increasing to B decreasing. These lines are called null lines because either dA by dt is zero, it's null, or dB by dt is zero, it's null. And if I want to do a phase diagram to understand the domains of my system, these represent the boundaries between behavior. So I can analyze the whole system here in terms of the crossing of the A null line and the B null line. And that's a dynamical systems concept and it would I, I should probably give you a lecture on how null lines work. Um, this is not the easiest place to start with. One problem is if you do this in XPP auto or in Mathematica, it will automatically calculate the null lines for you, just the way it'll calculate the unstable fixed points. Uh, in my case, I had to do it by hand. I did it analytically and then plotted them by hand. I actually did do something where I calculated one by numerically, but that's a little bit late. Okay. So this is, this is a bit of an interesting thing going on. But if I look at this diagram, it looks like in this bottom right region, 
A and B will go to infinity, they'll diverge. And they don't. It's just that I zoomed in here because to see the oscillation, I have to zoom in a bit. And so the next plot that we have is exactly the same thing, except on a bigger scale. And you'll see all of that interesting oscillation stuff is happening down here in the bottom left-hand corner where you can barely see what's going on. Uh, but what I can see here instead is that I have, and actually now that I look at it, this one has a problem too. It's interesting. Um, I'm going to see that the, I have another fixed point here at 10 comma 12. And this is again a crossing of these two null points. And I missed something when I did this, which is um, this diagram is actually showing that as an unstable fixed point and it's not. So there's something wrong in my calculation. I, I, I outsmarted myself. So once I, but once I've seen what's going on, I can do what Joel, and I apologize for scrolling here. I can do what Joel suggested, which is I could pick a value of B and scan the initial value of A and see what happens. And if I do that in a region where I cross this oscillation period, I would expect to see some region in which I get a stable fixed point, some regions in which I get zero, and some regions in which I get oscillation. And so now I can do those scans, and here I'm doing those scans, and here I'm scanning A for B equal to one. And I see that I only get steady states, I have a low steady state and a high steady state. B always goes to a low value, no matter what. Here I go up to Y uh, to B equals 7.5. In this case, I see A goes to a high steady state or a low steady state, but depending on the initial value of B, of A, B goes to a high steady state or a low steady state. So here I get a choice high, high, or low, or, or, or low, low. If I go for a very large value of B initially, I get something that looks pretty much the same. And what I'm missing here is the, oh, I'm sorry, I actually, I, I, I outsmarted myself. This is a different, this is a different, this is a different um, example. This is not the, not the relaxation. So let's see. So why don't we do why don't we do the relaxation oscillator? Let's see where the where the time series at the relaxation. Here it is. I was just showing you the wrong one. Here we go. So here's the relaxation oscillator. So here I'm scanning A with B equal to one. If A is initially very small, I get a stable small steady state for A. If A is just a little bit bigger, I get an oscillating steady state for A. If A is just a little bit bigger than that, this is that unstable fixed point. And if A is big, I get a stable steady state for A. Here I've scanned for a slightly bigger value of B, and I see those oscillations more prominently. And I can do perturbations again and see what happens. The, per the, the bifurcation scans I'm not using. If I look at my results here, I can see why I got something that I didn't understand. 
the stable steady state for A is at 40, 45. And if I look at my diagram here, I didn't go out to 45, I only went to 20. So why don't we do as a little bit of an exercise together? Why don't you see if you can change this code so that you scan between zero and 50, 60, on the X and the Y axis and tell me what you get. And that tells me actually I was not wrong with the arrows. I was wrong with my reading. That's my. So is it clear what the assignment is? Take the code snippet that we have here and change it so that it covers the region zero to 50 instead of zero to 20. And that's not intrinsically hard. You can search for the occurrences of the 20 and, and the change. And then tell me what you got. Yeah, there is another point. There is another cross in between the two lines at 44. You want to show it, you want to, show it to us? Sure. So we have another point yeah. around here, which is close to 45. If we print the steady states, I don't think it's here. Yeah. But I have here, although yeah, these, do. yeah, although these don't have the lines, right? They have a, the space and yeah. yeah, you could you could calculate. I calculated those steady states by hand, and so I could use the little the little function that I defined, define the steady states, and then and then run it over that regime to add that point. Yep. Yes, but this is this is good. And my worry was that it looked like everything was running away, that everything was blowing up. Mm -hmm. And the reason it looked like everything was blowing up was that I was actually this 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 point, which is green, should be red because normally you label stable steady states in red and green and and unstable ones in red. And this is what's called a saddle. This one here is a stable steady state, and so. I outsmarted myself by not by not finding the upper steady state. So here you're actually seeing that unstable steady state. Each time you cross, you alternate. So zero is a stable steady state. Sorry, a zero is an unstable steady state, stable steady state, unstable steady state, stable. When you cross, you alternate. Yeah. Yeah, the only unstable area is, is this area here, right? If you, well, the, no, if you escape this area over here, right, for A, at least in B, then you're out, right? You're out of the... 
the zone. So whenever you reach 12 B, you're basically out. Well, I think that cycle has its own basin. So it said if you're on a trajectory that falls outside of the basin of attraction for the limit cycle, mm -hmm. then you're being pulled towards something else. But the cycle itself, as you can it's see, stable. trajectories converging on it is 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 an attractor. Yeah. Yeah, this this is something that we haven't talked about because we haven't really talked about oscillations. This is the first oscillator. So just the way a steady state can be stable, an oscillator can be unstable or stable. In this case, you have a stable oscillation. Oh, yeah. Mm. You could have an unstable oscillation where the oscillation dies out. That would be a spiral into a stable steady state. Or you could have an unstable oscillation where you where the oscillation grows and does something, goes into something else, jumps to something else. But one of the things that you see in this example, and as I say, I outsmarted myself in it, um, is that is that oh, I'm trying to do this on your screen. I'm trying to save. Me, the, save uh, the, I'm trying to me, save the my save. I was trying to save my. Uh, my my val my my code on your screen. Uh, I enable, I enable annotation if you want to do it. No, it's okay. It's okay. I was just actually trying to save the code, which is <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but uh, one of the things that you see here, which could be an issue, is that to really explore this, you have to have multiple resolutions. Mm -hmm. If I do something that shows me this steady state that that Joel is shown here on the right. I can't see all of the other things that are going on down here at the bottom left. Yeah. And so I actually to understand this picture, I would have to, I had to do three zoom ins mm -hmm. at three different scales of resolution. That's what I, I was that, trying to do on this one. And you look at it and it's yeah. so spread out. It's yeah. not worth it. Yeah. And so, so these, this is, again, these are, these are new concepts. And that's why I'm asking, I mean, I'm sure I'm giving you code. And Herbert, again, in chapter 13 has this program, the, the program we're using here to do these plots is in Herbert's chapter 13. But he only shows one example of it. And so I wanted you to, to try to go over a little bit of how to use it. So this is actually a very, this, this example is really a pretty one, but it's also reasonably complicated. Uh, one of the things that, you'll see in my version of the code, which I added was um, to, uh, to try to find uh, the, uh, the fixed points by hand. So I walk through uh, the value of dx, dA by dt and dB by dt as a function of A. And then I look for values where, where there's both zero. It's not a very elegant way to do it, but it works. I'm trying to paste this code for everybody, but I can't for some reason. So I'll show what I changed. You have to change here, the M grid, have to put it to 60. And then you also have to change the plot limit here to 60. That's it. Uh, and the in, null in, line line too. Yes. The lens space yeah. command after plot the null lines in the middle, in the middle of your code. Up here, null client x equals np lin space zero sixty. Yep, yeah. yeah, right here. That one needs to be changed. Too. Anyway, okay. So now, having gotten that, and let me see if I can let me let me put my screen back on for a second. Let me make sure that my code works before we get too too far into it. Everybody have the screen share back. Um, let me see if my my zero to sixty one works. It takes a little while to calculate because it's doing a lot of computation. Yeah, there it goes. That one's fine. So let me let me uh, I'll put this in the chat for people. Hmm. 
Yeah, I can't paste into it either now. Yeah, I don't know why. This was always a problem with CompuCell, but but Tellurium, the Jupyter Notebooks let you cut and paste. I wonder if there's a change in security settings by NanoHub or by Zoom. Why would that be? I literally copied and pasted into the chat like 30 minutes ago though, so I don't. Just a quick Google says that Zoom has a 500 character chat mm. message. Ah, uh, that's what it is. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let me. Yes, before we come up with conspiracy theories, we should think of the simple solution. All right. There we go. Okay. So now here is your assignment. Well, and I, I'd like to be to break groups out a little bit, not have everybody do the same thing. I'd like one group to ask the question: if I change some of these parameters, pick a parameter, what happens to these fixed points? Oh, it's Herbert picked these sort of unusual values of these parameters. And you don't have to do this by a scan. You can do it by hand if you like. Uh, just try some different values, for example, of K2. You could just go around the room and assign it. Uh, one person, maybe Joel, uh, you pick, uh, you change the value of K1 and see what happens to these diagrams. Um, Connor, you change the value of K2, see what happens to these diagrams. Gabriel, you get K3. Eden, you get K4. Supriya, you get uh, H. And again, I'm not asking you to do a parameter scan. I'm just asking you to change, try making you know, K2 half of what it is or a quarter of what it is or twice what it is and see what happens to these structures. Do any of the fixed points disappear? Do they cross in a different way? Does the stability change? So that's the assignment for the first group of people. And for the second group of people, this seems like being a chorus director in a Christmas sing-along. Uh, for the second group of people, uh, that would be, let's see, how far did I get? Uh, Peter, Sean, Grant, Zach, Danusha, Lindsay. I would like you, uh, Peter, Sean, and Grant, I would like you to start with an initial condition that oscillates and find a perturbation at some time that turns the system from oscillating to being steady. It either knocks you into the high steady state or the low steady state out of the oscillation. And then, and that's the trickiest one, which is why I want four people to try it, because that one's a little tricky. And you can tell me why it's tricky after you've tried it. Lindsay, you, you've done a lot of dynamical systems. You probably know beforehand why it's tricky, but for the people who haven't tried it, you'll find out there's a little bit of trick to it. And then uh, Zach, Danusha, and let's see, I maybe if I said Lindsay was, I put Lindsay in the, the fourth, third group. But the last group I would like to start with a steady state and kick it so that it oscillates. So what I want you to do is write a simulation of a time series, start with an initial condition that reaches a steady state, and then have an event that kicks the system and turns on the oscillations. So that's the first group. The second group is start with a situation that oscillates have an event that kicks it into non-oscillation. And it's a little bit cheating to just set everything to zero. You can only change A or B at once. You can't change both. 
And I should say that fundamentally, if you look at this picture, not that picture, but the, pic the first one we did, this picture, this picture tells you what you have to do. And so this is really an exercise in interpreting that picture and understanding what it means so that you can, you can uh, use it. And I, if you haven't done dynamical systems, I realize this is throwing people in a little bit in the deep end, uh, but it's learning by doing. And, and after we played with these things, I think then going back and doing the basic theory will make a lot more sense. The theory is pretty abstract unless you do those things. Zach, question. Yeah, so um, this is for the second, um, the second, uh, I guess, system that we were looking at, not the third one. This is, this is the, so, so in the homework problems, this was the third, the third of the five examples in the homework, but we skipped the first example. Okay. Uh, in the notebook that we have, so in the notebook that we have, the beginning of the notebook is the first, is the second homework problem, the second part of the homework problem. Then there are two, there are two um, cells in the notebook that are Herbert's code from the textbook, which we're not using. I, I pulled those in simply as templates to use for, for doing the other code. And so if you look, let me walk you through what's in this notebook. Again, I didn't have time. I was working on this till the last minute, so I didn't have time to organize it as much as I'd like. If somebody wants to come and clean it up and make it pretty, that would be nice. Um, so if we walk through this notebook, the first cell is the, first, is the second example in the homework, and it does time series and perturbations and bifurcation. And because there's only one variable, there are no plots of the kind that we were just talking about. The second cell in the notebook is a simulation of Herbert's that plots phase portraits uh, without plotting the arrows. And that's not really that useful. I was trying it out. So it's just there because I wanted Herbert's code available to me. The third one is the phase portrait example. Uh, and this is the code that I extended to do what we've been doing here. Uh, this is Herbert's uh, 13.6, I believe. And he's done it for a latch circuit and we will do a latch circuit, but he picked a different latch circuit from the one that we're work, going to work. Um, and so this is his uh, uh, phase portrait uh, for that particular latch. So that's Herbert's example. And again, that's not one we're working with right now. That was template code that I was using. I didn't want to delete Herbert's code until I was sure I understood how it worked. So I wanted to keep his bare code there. The next one is our example here that's on the screen. And the first one is doing time series analysis. And perturbations and perturbations. But the parameter scans aren't implemented. I didn't do that. And the next three are these examples that we've just done, which is plotting those phase portraits, um, which are the ones we've just walked through. So the people who are doing the time series. What you want to do is grab the time series part of this, just this little bit here, run it, add the event trigger that we had uh, from, the, from the first example, and then try to find an initial condition where with no event, you get a steady state, and then find an event that turns it into an oscillator for the first group of people. And for the second group of people, find a steady state, find something that gives you the oscillation to begin with, and then a perturbation that turns it into a steady state. And if you want to be ambitious, you could try to turn it into one of the multiple steady states that are possible for the system, the high one or the low one. Uh, 
for the parameter people, you use exactly the code we have here. The only thing you're going to do is you're going to go in and change the value of K1. If you were a K1 person, you'll change the value of K2 if you were a K2 person and maybe screenshot your results so that you have something to show. Okay. Does that now make more sense? And, and if, 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 if the thing that I asked you to do, you've forgotten, do something. One of these examples. There's a lot to do. This is a very rich problem, really a very rich problem. And a very interesting circuit. You only have two A and B, and this is capable of giving you a stable low value, a stable high value, or an oscillator, depending on what the initial conditions are. That's actually pretty remarkable given that you only have three interactions. Uh, could you put us into breakout rooms to work with our little groups? Okay, let me see if I can set that up. That's a good idea. We haven't used breakout rooms much. Uh, let's see, can we do breakout rooms? Breakout rooms, okay. Uh, uh, well, let participants choose rooms. How many do we need? I will create, how many breakout rooms do we need? And what should I call them? I will create four. The first one will be parameter exploration. The second one will be um, stable steady state to oscillator. And yeah, I think you're right. Working together is a good idea. The third one will be oscillator to stable. And was there anything else we needed or is that enough? And the fourth one will be Giuliano or other questions, how's that? All right. So the, you all have your, your freedom to go to one of these rooms, work on it together. And let's say, how long do people think they need to do that? You can you can just come back when you're when you've got it done. That's that's pretty interesting. It looks like Peter needs some companionship. So everybody should be moving. Everybody should be moving into some room. Even if we're done. I thought you said if we're done to come back. Well, uh, which was the one I asked you to do? Uh, the oscillator to stable. Okay, so what I would ask you to do, if you got it that quickly, why don't you join the oscillator to stable group and and give and explore? You can do multiple oscillators. So so so, what was what's the what's the what's the, what's the trick? that comes up with the oscillator to stable one. If you just did one perturbation for one case, you mm -hmm. don't see it. Well, I took your parameter scan because uh, it shows both uh, some oscillators and then some stable points. Right. And then for all of those um, simulations, I just, uh, I had an event to increase the, the concentration and it knocked some of them out of the oscillation to the steadies and other ones it uh, killed them off, and other ones it, they went back to oscillation. So couldn't really tell you what the magic is, just uh, that it's working. <laughs> so, but I think that that's the point. Depending on where you are in the phase of the oscillator, 
the same perturbation could do something different. Yeah. And, and, and you know, if you kick everything really, really hard up, then you're always going to find that high stable steady state. But for small perturbations, depending on where you are in the phase of the oscillator, you might come back to oscillations, you might kick it to stable high, you might kick it to stable low for the same perturbation, depending on where it is relative to the oscillation phase. Yeah, I am seeing some results that are a little um, uh, not, not intuitive. I don't know if you want me to share now or just wait till uh, the groups come back. Well, that's why I was thinking you maybe should join that group and, and see what they get and, and work on that together because there's a lot to explore. The place that this becomes very, um, Danusha, are you going to join a group? I'll join though, thank you. No, no, but but I, let me finish my comment because I, I'll make it again, but I think it, I wanted to, and Joel, maybe you should join the parameter exploration group because that was your assignment. Right, I basically uh, done too, but okay, I'll- I know, but, but help them out. Mm -hmm. It's a group assignment, even if you've done, you can always do more. Yeah, but it's Sean, true. just just to just to just to cover this, um, the place this comes in is in the heart. Uh, it winds up that the oscillations, uh, cardiac oscillations, uh, can be turned off, uh, which is usually not a good thing with the heart. And so, um, but. The turning off the oscillator is, is the heart's pretty stable oscillator, but it winds up the relaxation oscillators of the kind that you have in the heart or this one always can be turned off. There's always some way to turn them off with a perturbation. And in the case of the human heart, it winds up you don't need a huge perturbation. And so there, there are a, a series of very famous incidents, uh, the Crown Prince of England, for example. Um, where somebody gets hit in the chest with a tennis ball or a baseball and their heart stops and they die. And it's not because of mechanical damage to the heart. It's because it just gives a little kick to the heart at the wrong time in the oscillation and turns off the oscillator. And, and in okay. those cases, if it had been a tenth of a second earlier, a tenth of a second later, the same perturbation wouldn't have caused a problem. Okay, that might explain the confusing results I'm, I'm getting because it does seem like I would expect it to go towards this stable point, but instead right. it just shuts off. So. so one thing to do then is to change the time of the perturbation and ask the question, yeah, right. does that, it get the same outcome with the same perturbation, but at a different time? For some of some perturbations, no matter when you do it, you'll get the same result. Right, right. But I others, did do that um, uh, actually because uh, yeah. I was wanting to play with that. And yeah, it was like certain oscillations, like on this particular one, uh, they're like all dying, whereas uh, previously only one of them was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank so you for the you, elaboration. Uh, so, well, because it, it's it's a really interesting example. I mean, Herbert just sort of threw it there, and it's really interesting. So. So if you wanted to join, okay, I guess oscillator to stable. So Lindsay's back. So, so Lindsay, Sean and I were just talking about some of those results. Oh, okay. Yeah, Did Zach and I found it? one, so. Great. So I guess my question for you is, you found one, but there, tell you what, Sean, why don't you and Lindsay go back to that room and talk about your findings together a little bit? Yeah, so I think it's it's really interesting. Take a few minutes and talk about that because this is a very interesting and for the neuroscientists in particular, it's an important problem. All righty. And we could do it here in this in the in the in the top level too. I don't have probably don't have to be in the breakout. Sean just joined the breakout. Zach, I guess I'm sending you back to the breakout to talk about some of, uh, of Sean's findings and exchange ideas, if that's okay. Uh, sure. Uh, so I'd be talking to a different... Okay, yeah, go for it. I'm sorry. Is it... So, so weren't you in the oscillator to stable group? Yes, yeah, with Lindsay. 
Okay, so Sean never joined you because he was talking to me about his results on that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought that there were supposed to be other people. I was a little confused right, by so, that. So Sean was supposed to be with you, but he, 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 he got it done very quickly and he wanted to ask me a question about it before he joined you. And then you guys oh. finished before he, before, he, before he had time to join you. But he had a really nice result and I wanted him to talk. I wanted you to share that with each other and then maybe you can talk about it with the group. Uh, okay. Sounds uh, good. Just just a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, Hayden, I don't know. This is an experiment to try to do it this way. Maybe, maybe a suicidal experiment. Uh, the breakout rooms. Well, but also trying to really do dig in and do some more you know, heavier problem solving. Them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good um, change of pace at the very least. If it doesn't work, we won't do it again. But I thought it was worth trying something that is a little bit more open, open a little more exploratory. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because I had fun with it. I was up. I was up till very late last night writing this code because I I I, I kept saying. It. And I didn't finish it, as you see. It's not. It's not. It's not completely finished. I kept going to finish. Connor, did you guys find anything interesting on parameters? Yeah, I think we finished scanning all the parameters. The other should be back soon. But we should be. And people can give me their feedback about this kind of class organization. So I will say, um, I was talking to people in the breakout room before, as far as Python demonstrations of phase portraits go, this is actually one of the more thorough files that I've seen of examples. I, I think that this could like generally be a helpful resource for people even beyond this class. Um, there, there's some stuff on GitHub that shows how to construct simple face portraits in Python, but nothing that's this thorough and includes the null clients and things like that. Yeah, well, the problem here is the null clients are done by hand. In other words, I, 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 I inverted the, I inverted the, I found the null clients analytically. And, and uh, that's not generalizable. So, so we really should do the null clients by searching for them doing them numerically. And then the, the, the other thing that we'd probably need to do uh, is to, um, I think actually finding that unstable, you know, if you find a pair of stable fixed points, you know there's gotta be an unstable fixed point between them. And so actually doing that time reversal trick uh, if you find the stable fixed points first and then you pass that to the unstable finder, it should work. And so if you wanted to try to play with that a little bit and, and, and sort of automate it, uh, or at least just say, you know, put in the values you got for the stable fixed points here and then run this, uh, that might be, uh, might be uh, just sort of give the workflow for it. Because uh, then we could plot the unstable fixed points as well, which would be nice. Yeah, I can look into that. As I say, I was, I was saying I was up till late last night and then I was working on it today too. So I, I, I kept thinking. Originally it was going to be very, it was a very simple notebook. And I thought, oh, there's so much here to explore I wanted to share. Well, did you have fun with it at least? Oh, I had a lot of fun. I, had, I, I don't get to sit down and code very often. So it was a lot of fun to do and to spend some time uh, doing it. Uh, but as I say, I would have done, but I would have done some more cleanup, and there's some things that didn't get finished. Um, 
Plus, as you saw, I made a mistake here that, you, that, 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 that Joel caught, basically. So uh, uh, it's, uh, but it's it's a nice it's a nice system. It's again, I mean, Mathematica is one line to do this, and XPPR is one line to do this. But but it's not so bad to do it this way. No, I I think, and this is why I was saying how great it is. The fact that there aren't that many great examples, the hurdle for self teaching from examples that you find open source online are typically pretty lacking. That's part of the reason why I finally just switched to learning Mathematica just because it's one thing if you're sitting with someone, they're showing you how to do it. Um, but to try to do it from scratch, if there's not great documentation, it's it's just a whole nother level of unnecessary hurdle. Well, I think I think Herbert's little, little template is very good. But but he doesn't talk about how to how to use it. And so it did take me a little bit of time to figure out how to how to make it. But but it also it, it's also a bit of an a bit of a of a of a proof to you guys that I actually do the do the homework problems myself. I don't just assign them. Grant, question, comment. Yeah, so I'm just working with Peter, and I think, well, you know, our problem is to start at a steady state and then move to an oscillating mm -hmm. state. So, I mean, the first step is to find where that, like, I think we're trying to find where the unstable steady state is, is when we want to start from. And I'm just, I quite, I didn't quite understand how Connor said he went about finding that. It sounds like he just did a scan for the values and he was able to find it, but. So, well, so for you, so, sorry, I was going to say that you're making your assignment harder than it is, or that it was. That the, the assignment would start with a stable steady state, which you can find very easily just by running the time system forward, see what the stable steady state values are. Um, if you if you want, you can look at the at the um, plot, and one of the stable steady states is 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 down here at the bottom, which is small. Basically, everything dies. And the other stable steady state is the one that, um, that's the unstable one. And the other stable steady state is the one that, that uh, Joel found, which is here at about 45 comma 12. Okay. And so uh, I, would, I would just start, um, start from one of the two, either the high one or the low one. And then kick it, and the trick is going to be that the region where you have oscillations is this little region here in the bottom left. Uh huh. If you start from the bottom, kicking yourself into that oscillator isn't too hard. If you start all the way over here on the right, you have to kick the system pretty hard to get it all the way back, because uh, you have to cross this unstable steady state. So you have to kick it all the way down to get it below that stable steady state. Okay, I think I know what I need to. Do. Then thanks. Okay. So if you want to go back and talk to Peter a little more, that's fine. If you want. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, it's fine if you started from the bottom one and went up. That's okay too. But the the, the harder one is from the top. Okay. So it looks like the oscillator, the stable thing. That's the, that's the one that's the most interesting. I think, but. What did people find on the parameter exploration? Were there any interesting things that you saw? Did any of the steady states appear or disappear when you changed the parameters? Yeah. I mean, if you want me to show, I can show, or if you want sure. us to wait for other people to come. Well, why don't we, why don't we go through it once now Okay. And then when the other people come back, I may ask you to briefly go through it again. Okay, just give me a second. Let me find it. So that's that's the one problem with doing it this way. I don't want I don't want to break up those discussions if they're productive, but I don't want you to have to wait. So so we'll right. And I have a billion of tabs open, so just give me a second. <laughs> And I, I was saying for the, the, 
part of the reason that I wanted to dig in on this one for the steady state to oscillator and oscillator to steady state is because I know there are a lot of people interested in neuroscience in this class. And that, the, the, that those two examples, steady state to oscillator and back, are under perturbations are things that neuroscientists consider a lot. They're problems of great in, of, of significant interest in those. Maybe not these days, but used to be. Okay, great. So K1 in this case is double. And we just see that the second steady state uh, is later. Right, it was before it was 45 and now it's around, I don't know, 90 or something. Okay. And did, and, did, the, did anything happen in the bottom left? Did, did the steady states that were there before the oscillator disappear or is it still there? Uh, that's a good question. I didn't check that, you know, resolution. I should probably go back and check that resolution, but it, yeah, I, I think that in that case, there is one that is like 10 times less that we see that there one of the steady state basically disappeared. It's not crossing anymore and not crossing here. So I don't... So, I, so, so if you run the time series for that one, that K1 equals 0 0.045, mm -hmm. does it oscillate or do you get a pulse? I haven't tested. I should probably do it because that looks like excitable medium where you get an oscillator. So, 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 so in neurons with action potentials, you get a situation in which the, there's a stable steady state. But if you kick it a little bit further away, you get a pulse and then it comes back, and that's mm. the ghost of an oscillator. Mm. So then, if you push the system a little further, it oscillates. Right. Okay. I'll I'll do the lower resolution for these, the pictures of the lower right. resolution for these especially, right. and this one. And I'll try to print a time series for these values too, so we have more things to analyze. Just to see if it oscillates or if it if it if it goes spike and then comes back. Sounds good. That that that's an interesting result, and that's a classic a classic bifurcation between them between what's called excitable media and, and oscillation. I had a weird plot that I tried to do that before this class, which is this one. <laughs> so I tried to put all the values possible that I was thinking and make them do lines and see where the steady state would be on those scenarios. But it's too cramped. It's, you cannot really see anything after a while. Yeah. No. But it was trying to do that and type of analysis too. Okay, what about the other people with parameters? That was which parameter was the one you were looking at, Joel? K1. K1. Did anybody get anything interesting for one of the other parameters? Yeah, I, I can show mine. I was actually just cleaning up the code a little bit more, but what I changed will not make a difference for this. Um, oh, I'm sharing the wrong notebook. I have two open right now. Um, is it? Yes, it's this one. Okay. Um, so I ended up just doing a scan for K2 from the value we started at and increasing it. Um, let me move all of your faces so I can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, so this is the initial plot that we had. What I was just changing is that I realized I left the fixed points, which gets confusing. Um, so like if you look here, there's not a point that's being marked where um, the null clines cross just like before, right. but more egregious is that I left a fixed point there when the null clines aren't crossing at all. So that's what I was okay. changing. So that's clear. So there you really have a bifurcation because the yes. null sign crossing yep. has changed. Yes. So we have a bifurcation. The next thing I was going to do is try to find that nice little value where things are just beginning. Um, to shift and they're just like slightly brushing up against each other yeah. Yeah. and then from there you just see that we get a continuous shrinking of this null cline um and it makes sense i we were talking about this in the breakout room that the yeah. top null cline never changes because k2 is only a parameter in one of the two equations um yeah 
So yep. this is a classic tangent bifurcation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and if you if you if this is actually it would be a really nice thing to show everybody because here you have you have one you have your three steady states. Yeah. And then yeah. you then two of them uh, uh, collide. That unstable steady state and the upper stable steady state collide and annihilate. Mm -hmm. And then okay. you're left with only one steady state, which is the lower steady state, right? The only one you have left now, everything goes to that fixed point uh, to, the, to, the, to the left, right? You see all of your flow is into that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> although it looks like it actually goes to something like 0.2 comma 12 rather than to zero. But you have to look at the time series to see what's going on. Or you'd have to zoom in, do the plot where you zoomed into the small the, the small one. Yeah, I can yeah. do one where I zoom in too. Um, the only downside is then you risk losing the gradual line there. So I'll have to do a second series of plots yeah, I to show just, that. I, that's why I had three. I did one over six sure. by six, one over 20 by 20. That makes sense. Okay, Gabriel, what about you? What did you did you scan a plot and did you get something fun? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, so mine was K3, and uh, as we, so I started, I, I did a couple here, just because actually at first, I had only done uh, 0 0.01, and then 0.45, and then 0.95, and I was like, oh, well, actually, all the interesting stuff is happening more closer to 0.01, um, but so as we turn K3, we can see it slowly. Actually, what's interesting is that the null clines cross and we see a little bit more of a, a wider limit cycle begin to happen or it starts to change shape a little bit. We get to see something, they start going in different directions here. We can see that this is the stable manifold or this is the it in a limit cycle, but then here it's stable. Um, and then it starts to split and we see it, it, it kind of degenerate just into to this one manifold. And then that continues the, the higher, the more you turn K3, the more it degenerates just to that single manifold. So that one, you probably want to do the bigger plot too, mm. so that you could see what happens on the right. Because, because this, this is always, I think this is always bounded. I don't think you're ever going to get, so there's going to be some stable fixed point off to the right. That's the one we missed before. So I would I would repeat that at exactly those values, yeah. but plot on the sixty by sixty, uh, and see if you you may have to make it eighty by eighty to see that upper upper bound, but that's really nice. Again, you have a beautiful uh, tangent bifurcation where you get the crossing of the null clines like that, and uh, and you and you see the, the the disappearance of that that oscillation, and again for. For neuroscientists, this is exactly what happens when you do depolarization of a neuron. And you go from excitability to, to steady, uh, to, 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 to bursting. This is exactly the, 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 the bifurcation that you have. Um, well, I shouldn't say exactly because, but, but the, 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 the class of bifurcation is the same. Eden, what did you get? So mine is pretty much the inverse of Gabe's, which makes sense because um, if you look at the equation, K4 is in the negative term and K3 is in the positive term. So instead of turning it up and having them having them sort of separate, um, like Gabe showed, it's the opposite where you turn up K4 and they and they converge. Um, similar to what you were just saying too, like if this was a bigger plot, which, which I will also make, you would see that second fixed point. Um, but I think it's pretty clear here in the flow, you can see how the oscillation is created as you turn K4 up. So the first two plots show um, no oscillations. It's only two fixed points, which you can't see one of. Um, and then those null clines approach each other somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2, they collide and there's a bifurcation. Um, and then from there, it's just, it's just the specifics of the values of the fixed points that changes. Yeah, and that this, uh, you see, right? I mean, that 0.25 seems to have, well, 0.45 has a pretty big 
region of oscillation to 0.25, 0 0.45, pretty big region of oscillation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's in, it's very interesting between 0.1 and 0.2, where you have that 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 bifurcation, that that that, that tangent bifurcation, the hop bifurcation is really pretty neat. Yeah. yeah so if you wanted to add those extra plots, that would be. That would be good. So I, I found a way of finding if there was oscillation or not. I just used the co the code that I have before. If you want to see that, I think it's cool too. And it's okay. Done. We could certainly share that. Let's let's just hear from let's hear from the people who just came back. So okay. oscillated to stable people. How did how did it go? It was good. We just discussed um, some specific cases that at first looked counterintuitive, but figure out sort of where the, which arrows are gonna to correspond to those. I mean, I was saying, I was saying earlier, uh, talking to, to Sean, that one of the things that, that is that the same perturbation uh, at different phases of the oscillation could do different things. So, so you kick it up, you kick it up when it's at the bottom of the oscillator, that may do something different from kicking it up when it's at the top of the oscillation. And so the, the, the complication with the oscillator to stable is that the same, the same kick at different phases of the oscillator might do something different. Um, and, uh, but let's, we'll, we'll, let's we'll, be, we'll look forward to seeing that in a minute. I don't know whether Grant, uh, Giuliano, can I ask you to go visit Grant and Peter and see if they're more ready to come back and present? There's always a problem that if I'm zooming this, if I'm if I'm if I'm streaming this, I have to stay in the main. I have to stay in the main room. I can't. I can't move to the breakout rooms. Although there's, hey, there's a new feature in Zoom. It says you can now broadcast your voice instead of just sending text messages to the breakout rooms. It used to be you couldn't, you couldn't do that. So you'd send all these people to the breakout rooms and then you'd say, please come back. And everybody would be busy and they would ignore it. Is that feature called God mode? It's... Well, you could always close the breakout rooms. You could just close them. But, but sometimes you don't want to do that. You want to find out, are people ready to come back? And there was no way to do that. There was no way to send messages to people. You can't send it, you can't chat to somebody in a breakout room from the main room. So it's a funny, uh, I don't know why. They, and you can't send a message specifically to one person in a breakout room. You can only broadcast. So you'd be sent, sending messages, would so-and-so please come back? Okay. Okay, so uh, I've heard a little bit from everybody, Peter and and uh, Grant. How to go? I believe we found what you're looking for. Okay, do you want to share that with everybody? I think everybody's back now. So why don't we start with you? The 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 parameter exploration people have a few a few things they're still working on. They have some neat results. Let me start by showing the face portrait. So we know there's some point that's going to be, well, it's not a good one. Yeah, so we started looking at the phase plot. And so we wanted to start from some st steady state. And the first one that we were able to find was actually the unstable steady state. Uh, and so we set our initial A and B to that value that we found. And then we did a perturbation. And we showed that it started oscillating. That's the graph right there. That's really neat. That's a, that's a great choice. I'm really pleased you did that. And then we also wanted to, just for the sake of exploration, we found a different steady state that looks like a stable steady state, which is the one that was at a much higher value. And we did the same thing where we did a perturbation and it went back to that same steady state because it's stable. But if you kick it hard enough, you should be able to get to the oscillator. But you have to figure out exactly how to kick it to get it. Yeah. 
It would have to be a very big negative kick on the A or the X. Yeah, it's so long, apparently. Yeah, so something like minus thirty, minus forty, or something like that. You have to, you have to sort of. Yeah, there you go. You got it. Of course, that's sort of violating the idea of what a perturbation should be. I mean, if you have to, if you have to totally yeah. do this. If you have to, if you have to, that's basically resetting the system, not just perturbing it. But you got, but you got it one, so that was good. Uh, going from the lower steady state, the small steady state, up to the oscillator is easier. But that's a good example. Yeah. Was there anything else that was in there? Well, anything, any other interesting behaviors you found while you were working with it? No. The other thing uh, I think here are just, uh, you know, choosing think... either X or Y and making very small adjustments. But go ahead, Grant. Um, do, you, do you still have the graph of the first perturbation you tried for the oscillator one? The one where it was basically all, the oscillation was different than this oscillation. Uh, I'm not sure if you still have that graph, you but basically from our, you? from our first, uh, that first graph we did, we did a different perturbation and it ended up doing a different type of oscillation. Oh, well, that's interesting. Which I think makes sense because like in that phase, Plot. If depending on where you shift to, you're going to end up going in a, around a different loop, right? So depending on what the perturbation is, you could kind of end up with a different type or a different, maybe a different shape of oscillation. Does that stay no matter how long you run it for? Uh, I don't know. Try try it out, Peter. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm wondering. Uh, it, if it's the parameter values, I'm wondering if like that's like it's slowly gradually closing in and you would see them converge in amplitude um, if it's long yeah. enough. And this one, I mean, this one's interesting. It's increasing in amplitude so far. You try to look at a bigger range. That's actually a really nice example because they're, they're yeah, let's keep, keep going to a longer time and see what happens. Because, yeah, so there, so there, it, it does look like you reach a, a a stable limit cycle, but it takes a long time. That for this one, you probably need to increase the number of points in your simulation from a thousand to something bigger. Yeah, there you go. Maybe even a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, same idea. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. So it takes a long time to, to stabilize. So you're very so so that the 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 limit cycle is almost neutrally stable. That's really interesting. I had I hadn't done that 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 example. It's actually really pretty. We should add that to the notebook, Honor. We should. If you're collecting things to make this notebook better, we should please send the code for that so we can add that to the notebook. Because okay. uh, that's a really pretty example. Okay. Um, how about the people oscillated to stable? You want to tell us about what you found? Sorry, could not come off mute. Um, so I'm sharing here. Hopefully you guys can see it. I uh, we I did remove uh, the B species, um, or sorry, actually, I, I think I changed this afterwards. Um, the A species is no longer shown in the graph, just uh, to make it easier to um, speak to what it is we're looking at. Um, and so this was a parameter scan of the initial values of uh, a species, species A, uh, given that species B was fixed at four uh, initially. And as you see, we start with these oscillations, except for the ones that go to the fixed points at zero and 12. Um, and so what I did was um, just perturb the system at time 150. Um, all of these uh, are just increased uh, species A's concentration by 10. Um, and uh, you'll see that like some of the oscillators uh, do get, go back into their uh, oscillating form. Um, some will go to uh, 
the other ones, I guess, uh, we'll just go to one of the other fixed points. What we were confused about and what I'm going to phone a friend to explain um, is that uh, intuitively, I would have thought that after increasing one of these lines uh, above this stable point at 12, I would have expected those to then stabilize at 12 instead of coming all the way down to stabilize at zero. Um, and then to explain that, I will point to this chart and wait for my friend to answer the phone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, can, do you mind if I share my screen? I think that'd make it easier. You bet. There we go. Um, just have to, can I share my screen? There we go. Uh, start broadcast. Sorry, I'm using my iPad to, to zoom in today, so it's a little difficult. Can everyone see uh, my screen? All right. Yeah, we see it, Zach. Ooh. Okay, so there we go. perfect. Yeah, so um, so essentially what we were confused about was why were some of them, why was it sometimes the, this, uh, why would end up where X was at zero? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so essentially what we, what we came to the conclusion of was that if it starts out with a low enough initial X value, um, it'll be in a, you know, it'll be in a, a, a cycle, but eventually, what will happen is, is that as we perturb X to increase it, instead of normally, these will just go out here and just continue along this null climb. But for some of them, as they're on this edge right here, right here, um, they'll actually go into this along this null climb and continue here until they go down here. And so as a result, the, uh, the X values end up going down to zero. And so that's that's essentially the conclusion we came to. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's an important result that that well, depending on where you are in the oscillation when you hit it, you can get a different outcome. The same perturbation can can lead to different results depending on where in the cycle you are. Because if suppose you move, suppose you increased B. Uh, whether you increase B at the left or the right, you might cross a different null climb, wind up moving to the zero or to the high value. And, and the example I gave before, which I'll repeat now for everybody, but is, so, so most, most biological oscillators have this relaxation oscillator form. And they have the same, this kind of pattern of stability where there's a, usually a big region where there's oscillation and there'll be some places where there's some stable steady state usually on either, either end. And one example of that is your heart. And uh, the classic example of this, and I was saying this famously, one of the crown princes of England died this way, is that you're playing baseball or tennis and you get hit in the chest with a tennis ball. And that's not enough to damage your heart, but it is enough to perturb the oscillations of your heart. And the days before, uh, before uh, resuscitation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, when your heart stopped, that was it. And so it winds up that you can die from being hit in the chest with a ball, not that hard if it happens to be in exactly the wrong time in the oscillator cycle of the heart. And so, what was it, Prince Frederick, if, it, if he'd been hit, you know, 100 milliseconds later or earlier, he wouldn't have died from being hit in the chest with a tennis ball. Uh, and so, uh, so the, the trick, and the reason I, I, I said there was a trick was this issue that the same perturbation can do something different during the during the the oscillation. If you're starting from a stable steady state, there isn't an issue because the perturbation is always from the same state. But when you're starting from an oscillator, there's the phase of the oscillator that's added onto it, and that makes it a little bit more complicated. So that's great. Okay. And do the do the people anything you want to discuss about those two? I think those are great explorations. Is there anything people want to talk about about the so otherwise, if any about those two examples, um, 
I don't want to cut off the discussion because it's uh, it's uh, it's um, it's important to to, to 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 hear what people have to say. Um, what about uh, what about um, the parameter scan people? I heard a little bit they 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 showed me the results, but I'd like to let them present to the group. I should probably start right because I'm K1. Okay, that's why you're all waiting for me. Ah, I see. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, I was just playing around here with some other things. Here it is. Just give me a second. Okay. So if we double, if we double the value for K1, we have a late even later than 46 uh, steady state. This is almost like 90, so doubles. It tends to double too, it seems. And this is like the zoom in this area here. So limiting in two and two, we still see that there is an oscillation, but a very small one. I did this plot here to show, let me see if I can open in a different tab. Yeah. So there is still an oscillation here for the case of A equals one and B equals five. Uh, this is the, and this is the only case, right? Uh, I think we are told in the homework to compare to different values of K and different values of A in relation to B. So that's the case where we still have an oscillation there. If we go lower, I just did this, is this case here on the right. Uh, we still have two, pro, two points, two stable points. And I think we still have oscillations, but a very specific case here. So let me open this in a new tab here. And this case is, uh, B equals zero five and A zero five, so they're equals. In that case, we still have an oscillation. Now an interesting one, they want to oscillate and then go back in these cases and nothing changes for the other ones. Uh, 10 times bigger, as expected, it probably goes 10 times bigger too. We just have one uh, oscillating case, but then there is this spike here and I was trying to see if I can explore this a little bit more because this seems to be an interesting thing happening. And a very small K1, we don't have any crossing points anymore, which means there is no oscillation either. But you do see the ghost of the oscillation in right. the sense that if you start from a small, uh, from, from a, of the b equals zero and x small it goes up and then it comes down again right and so that 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 kind of pulse behavior is the ghost of an oscillator yeah and it's in a very specific value right uh let me see open a new tab yeah this case i think it's the first one. Oh, the last one so a equals five and b equals five is when you have a yeah. An oscillation or even just A equals five will get you the same thing. The same oscillation on B here in this case or the opposite. Well, we'll get an activation on A too. Okay, does somebody else want to show what they, they got for their parameter? We had some, we had some overlap with the sense that some of the parameters did the did sort of the opposite of each other. So we got simpler things. Uh, I have my scan, which I okay. cleaned let's up a little a bit. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so I was varying K2. So I started with the original plot. Um, for the sake of time, I removed where the fixed points are being plotted, just so it would they would not remain. So just remember that where the null clients intersect are where we have fixed points. I scanned from the initial parameter value of 0.01 to 0.08. And as you can see, you're getting this point where it's getting lower. This is 0. Uh, 0.02. Uh, 
Um, and then finally, you have a bifurcation occur where because these aren't intersecting anymore, these two fixed points um, have collided and annihilate. Um, and then this just keeps getting smaller. Uh, what I thought would be nice for people to see, though, is that I did a second plot where I put it close to where the bifurcation is occurring. And I more gradually slid it. So here you can see that there's still two fixed points. But then when it's just barely brushing, uh, I don't think I got it exactly right, but you're going to get to a point where you just have one. Um, and there are conditions to mark how you know that one is where a bifurcation is occurring. And then here is where it finally dips beneath. Um, yeah. And just below the bifurcation, you again you'll see the ghost of the of the what happens afterwards. So if you the do ghost. time series, yeah, yeah. So yeah. so right because because the flow is almost what you have when you have a yes crossing, yes not quite exactly yeah. And so if you look at the time series, then you'll see. The, the time series will change, but not, but, but it'll change more continuously than you'd expect. Um, because even though there is no fixed point there, it, it will slow down when it gets near where that fixed point was. That's um, fun. And you don't really see that in the, in the phase portrait, you don't see it because you're not, you're not seeing how fast you're going along. Right. along. I mean, one way to fix that, right, would be to, I'm pretty sure there's a way with, this type of plot in matplotlib to calculate the magnitude of um the of the vector field at that point and code it into the flows so that that would be one way to try to see that a little bit um i don't remember how to do that that off the top of my head yeah i guess you could do something like have a color code on it where the, no. the speed with which you were moving was colored yeah it might get really busy to hard to interpret but it could be interesting to do that Basically, it would be a third dimension in the plot. Yeah. Okay, Gabriel and Eden. Again, when the, 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 this is sort of a classic example in, in neuroscience of when when a, when a neuron goes from being excitable to being uh, being bursting to bursting. This is exactly the transition with it. Well, not again, I said exactly. It's, it's, it's very similar to the transition with it. All right, sorry, I was struggling to find my PowerPoint for some reason. Um, but I, I, I made the uh, wider thing, wider graphs. But uh, first I'll start here is what we can see is that slowly as we're twisting our K4 knob, um, our limit cycle begins to change a little bit over here. We see it kind of twist into a different shape, but then slowly as, as uh, K4 gets larger, we see it kind of de uh, degenerate towards this one null cline. Um, but then actually what's interesting is I notice once we uh, expand the plot, so I, so so over here, just for reference, this is a seven or it's a eight by eight or something like that. And then this one I did uh, 50 by 50, but um, you know, similar things we can see that, that this, uh, at the beginning, near point, uh, point zero 0.01, we have uh, an attractor up here. Um, but then, you know, not that much later, we just immediately lose that. And it slowly starts to spin down towards here. And then we just kind of get, you know, when it's big like this, we just kind of get a, uh, it's just all going towards that null line. So, yeah. That's, that's interesting. So you get, you get, in the, so as we, so let's look here. So as you go from 0, 0.0, is it the same sequence in the two plots? Yes. So here, so here you see 0 .00, 0 0.01, there's, there's a crossing. 0.1, there's a crossing. 0.2, you lose the crossing. So you lose the limit cycle when, or when you go from 0.1 to 0.2. And the other one, if we go back to the number two now, if we go back to number two now, now we're affecting that upper steady state. So in 0.01, it's not there because there's no crossing of those two lines at the top. And then somewhere between 0.01 and 0.1, that top one is coming down and crossing. And so the creation of that upper steady state is happening uh, as you increase the value. 
And then as you increase it too much, you destroy the limit cycle. So you actually are doing two things. For, for, for the number being too small, you have the limit cycle, but not the upper steady state. As you increase that value, you destroy the limit cycle, but the upper steady state persists. So that's actually pretty, that's actually a nice example. We could we could explore, you could zoom in a little bit on the on the values where it happens the way Connor did, but that's actually pretty neat. I didn't, I didn't, I'd never done the full analysis. So this is actually pretty nice. It's not pretty nice. It's nice. It's just, uh, Eden, do you have one you want to add anything? Sure. Um, so mine is. As I said before, mine is kind of the opposite of Gabe's because if you look at the equation, um, K4 is in the negative term um, of B, change in B, and then K3, which Gabe just went over, is the positive term. So as opposed to, you get sort of the opposite effect where if you if you turn up K4, and I'll show, I have the, the bigger plots here that that curve actually raises towards that point where they meet. Um, my guess is that they might meet at one because um, this is 0.95 in the bottom. These, these correspond um, with these here. But as you can see, there's no limit cycle at really low values. Um, and then somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2, um, there's bifurcation and, and this oscillation is created um, and that sort of grows and persists. And then, oops, did not need that. And then, there we go. Uh, you can see sort of a similar thing here where it's just that, that far raising. Uh, yeah, so in that case, yeah, it would be nice to go to one or, or 1 1.05 and yeah, see that I'll you lose that. the upper steady state there. Right. Yeah, yeah that's really, that's great. Again, for people who haven't done null clines, and uh, this is this is sort of a being thrown in, but I hope at least if, if you haven't done null climb, I mean, it sounds like most people in the room have, have had some experience with it, but but if you haven't, at least you're getting to hear about how you use them, because it, it they tend to be introduced in a very abstract way, and they're a very practical way of looking at what when when the behavior of the system changes. So to be to be this is actually it clearly shouldn't have just been part 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 C of a of a five part problem. It should have been broken out to be itself uh, because it's worth it's worth more exploration. But I I hope that 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 was uh, was interesting for people. Uh, Again, in terms of the structure of the class and things, this is a little bit of an experiment to try to do a little bit more in-depth uh, working together. And I'm glad that people went into breakout rooms and worked as, as groups. I think that that was a, something that was, uh, I, I hope that worked okay. We could try that I try that again in the future. I mean, a lot yeah, of next time, time we're gonna have Joel just drive over to our place since he was the only one not at our house. <laughs> Well, that works too. If you're, if you don't need a breakout room if you're already in the same room. So. Uh, but, uh, but there's some something to be said for virtual, uh, the virtual thing. I, you know, this I actually find with Zoom the fact that you could do screen shares and annotation. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Uh, and actually, if you want to share your screens. It's a lot easier to do it this way than it would be at a in a classic classroom without a Zoom. Right? I mean, if you wanted to show the results on your computer to everybody and we were sitting in a classroom, how do you do it? You have to walk up to the classroom at the front of the room, put your HDMI cable in. It's, it's a pain. So, so there, there, there are pluses and minuses. Okay, I think I think we've dug in about as much as we can to this to, to that problem. Uh, are there any last comments or questions about that? Um, I don't think, well, I'll, I'll talk to, let me just quickly, just for a minute. I'm not, I, th I think we've, I think with this exploration, we've done plenty on this. I don't want, I don't want to, uh, are, are you seeing both screens now? So, so. The last one that I was going to do, and I don't want to do it now because it's too much. I think I think we should move on. Uh, but I'll just show you my results. Was the toggle? 
And actually, the, 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 the example that Herbert had was the toggle too, but the functional forms that he used were a little bit different. Uh, his, his feedback loops were slightly different than the ones I gave you in the homework. And in the homework, I gave you an asymmetric toggle. I gave you uh, K2 not equal to K3. Uh, and that's, that's of some interest in its own right. But the toggle, let me come down to the toggle. The toggle looks like this. And here I've symmetrized it. So I've set both K2 and K3 to the same value. In this case, both to being uh, 0.2. And the toggle, in a sense, is the opposite of the oscillator. What you have here is that you have, as you might expect, suppose that I had, and, and, the, and, the, and the, there, there's an interesting thing which you can't, which this isn't set up to do, which is we know that the behavior of each one of these guys, A and B by itself, is that bistable autocatalysis. And so if I had no coupling between A and B, if I start out with a low value of A, A stays low. If I start out with a high value of A, A goes to the high fixed. If I start with a low value of B, B stays low. A high value of B, B goes to the high value. And now I cross couple them. And I cross couple them with inhibition. And the inhibitor now says that if A is high, B needs to be low. And if B is high, A needs to be low. And so I now should get a steady state either of A high, B low, or B high, A low. And for the parameters that I've given you here, that happens most of the time. But what I could do, in fact, if I wanted to be a little bit more interesting, is I could change the strength of the inhibition, I could make the inhibition a number between zero and one. Here, the inhibition is as strong as it can be, but I could make the inhibition weak. And as I make it weaker, I'll go from a system where A and B behave independently, and A can go to be high and B could go to be high, or A could go to be low and B could go to be low, to one where they try to force each other to be in opposite situations. And that's actually pretty interesting about it. If somebody wanted to do that uh, as an example, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, what you do is you add uh, a, a, a parameter that's a number between zero and one uh, here in the denominator. So instead of BH, it would be alpha times BH. And here, instead of AH, it would be alpha AH. If alpha is zero, the things are decoupled, they're independent. If alpha is one, you get this. Um, and then as you change that, you'll see you'll see the the what happens to the, the bifurcation. If I look at the phase portrait, here I've symmetrized it by making those two values the same. I see that I have three steady states. I have one which is high, high B, low A, one which is high A, low B, and one of which is zero, zero. And these, these, uh, these, um, the, um, the null clines don't cross. So there's nothing going on in the middle. On the other hand, again, you can see a ghost here because they almost cross here at this point. And so if I come in here from A being just a little bit below B, I mean, so A being just a little bit above B, I wind up always going to high A, high B, high A, low B. If I start out with A, B just a little bit above A, I come into high A, high B, low A. If I start out with them exactly equal, then I come along this diagonal, I go to zero. And so one thing you could try, maybe if for a minute or two, maybe 
I, I give people a choice. Do people want to do this little exploration now of this one? Or would you prefer to have a lecture for 20? We have 20 minutes left, which is not a lot of time. So, so I don't know whether you'd rather have me start on the pulse generator for the for the for the the feed forward network, which I can't get forward, can't, can't get very far through. Or do you want to explore this? Because there actually is something rather interesting going on here when we go from when we change the strength of the uh, when we change the strength of the couple. Uh, so so it's up to you. Um, but if we start, but one of the things you could do is start with a equal to b for different values of a and b and c or x and y in this case, and see if you hit this this uh, stable zero zero for this. Juliana, maybe you could do that while we're in the background. I didn't do that one, that do that one in person. Uh, clearly with this one, it's relatively easy to to throw your latch back and forth. Um, but you have to hit it pretty hard. You have to hit it pretty hard because you have to cross this. Basically everything matter, All the only thing that really matters is A bigger than B or B bigger than A. Uh, and if, if you can throw things across, then you go to the other one. But, you're, but, but the thing is you have to move pretty far. One thing we didn't talk about about the perturbations when I asked you to do the perturbations, and the people who did the unstable, the uh, Peter, when you did the unstable fixed point, you you two did the unstable fixed point. That was very interesting. Is that there are certain situations which you could change the state with a small perturbation. There are other ones where you have to kick it really far, and the reason it's a latch is because once you've gotten all the way over to here at x, equal, at x equals 10, y equals zero, or y equals 10, x equals zero, the, to get to the other one, you have to kick it a lot. And so this is intrinsically pretty stable. Um, if you did the circuit without the, the auto feedback, you just had A inhibit B and B inhibit A, without the auto feedback, you would find that you also get by stability, but uh, it's not as stable. It's easier to kick. So, so maybe maybe in our last fifteen minutes, instead of my lecturing, we should do one more exploration. We'll try this class as an exploration class. And so let me give you, I would say there are probably two groups here. And, and to get the null clients, you're gonna to have to do a little bit of work because the null clients are hand computed. So they're not gonna be drawn right. Uh, it's not hard to fix them because the changes are small, but you will have to edit the null client calculation. But I would suggest that one group do the following, which is turn off the autocatalysis. How do you turn off the autocatalysis? Let's look at this um, circuit here. Um, let's see, let's actually, I've got to be careful about this. Is this going to work? Um, a inhibits B. B inhibits I said that that was easy, and then I, I realized that may not be for this particular circuit. That may not be as the way I've got it written. It may not be as easy as I thought. I think Herbert's one. It's easier to do that um, because if I turn off A activates A, I get zero. In which case, I get nothing. So the inhibition won't work. And so how am I going to do that? I have to have something in the numerator that's not going to, not going to uh, be dependent. So that, one's, that one is a little trickier. The, 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 auto, the, auto, the cross inhibition by itself um, is a bit trickier than, than I thought. The, the one that's easy 
and maybe we can do I can I can give it as an assignment to people to play with now. We'll have everybody try it. So instead of breaking it out, we'll just do it together. Is what if we what if we make the strength of the inhibition a parameter? And so to do that, I'm going to have to edit the slide. And I can actually do that uh, not when I'm screen sharing this way. Let me come back and I'm going to edit that slide. No, I can't, I can't do it the way I've got it displayed. Um, I'll just stop the slideshow and we can do it that way. So the way you can make you can do this. is to say, I want to make this cross inhibition variable. The strength of the inhibition is given by B here is inhibiting A and A is inhibiting B. So I'm going to create, add a, a variable parameter alpha times B here and alpha times A here. If alpha is one, I get what I had before. If alpha is zero, these two things are totally independent. And what I should be able to see is what happens to this diagram as I change alpha. So do people want to try that? So now set set um, So that's what it is. So now why don't people make that change? Try this out. Add the alpha multiplier to these. And then see what happens. Start with alpha equals zero, which is these are uncoupled. Increase it to alpha equal one. And actually, if you make alpha bigger than one, see what happens. What if alpha is equal to two? And if you're if you're ambitious, if it's it's fine if you just change that you just replot this diagram. If you're ambitious, you might go in and look at the calculation where we calculated the null clines, and you'll see here in the null cline calculation. Uh, Well, I have to say it's not exceedingly visible directly. You have to you have to do it a little bit analytically. Set set this equation to zero, and then you'll see there's only one change you have to make to those two to add the alpha. But if people want to do that, uh, and then then the same change if you want to get the fixed points. So is that is that a reasonable thing for people to try? I realize. Then you didn't get in a lecture per se, but maybe it's uh, maybe it's sort of fun to try this out. Something that I haven't done. I know what the answer is. I don't know how to. I don't know how to do the one where I turn off the auto auto. Well, actually, it's not true. If I if I keep making alpha bigger, effectively, what I'm doing is making the auto catalysis less important. And so the limit as alpha gets big is equivalent to turning off the autocatalysis. So is that clear? Is a clear assignment? So the base assignment is to add this alpha to your, uh, to your declaration here of your function. And then try it for alpha, try Zero. Now you may want you may those may not be the best values, but 
it only take you a second or two to try those different ones. See what I mean? And then The base, the base, the base one shouldn't take, shouldn't take two. Give it a shot. If you get tired of that, the other one you could do is go back to Kate. I crashed PowerPoint. That's not good. So what I was going to say is that in the picture, in the in the in the equation that I that just disappeared, uh, I had K K two and and K one not equal to each other. I had point two and point six. In the plot I did here, I have them equal. You could try, you could try changing this back. Um, so the one I had was, uh, let me put this back to being uh, what it had before. I have K2 and K6, um, both 0.2. And the other one to try would be, um, go back to the original. K2 and K2. make it asymmetric. So we could have two groups. And one one group can do this and they're pretty cool. Grant. Um so I don't have that much experience with null clines. Uh and so when it comes to recalculating the null client, I'm not really quite sure how I should go about it. Do you know of any like is there any documentation or is it in Herbert's textbook kind of that gives us some guides on that? Okay, so that's one where so so i I've said I've said in my I've said repeatedly that that it's better to use it's better to to use um, to use arrow diagrams than than ODEs. The one time that that's not true is when you're calculating null clines. And so the reason I wrote the reason I wrote these differential equations, the reason I wrote these differential equations in the form of, I wrote these equations in the form of ODEs. That is, I combined the act of the the, the creation of A and the destruction of A in one equation, rather than to write them as separate arrows, was because of that. So the answer is that what you need to do is you need to set this to zero. That's the null client for, that is the X null client, is whatever, where, whenever the rate law for X, dx by dt is zero. So if I set this to zero, that gives me the X null client. If I set this one to zero, that gives me the Y null client. Now, typically, in this case, solving one is equivalent to solving the other because they're the same equation. In the in the oscillator one, they're different. They're they're structurally different. Um, typically, what you will find is that solving uh, solving x in terms of y versus y in terms of x one is simpler than the other. Just algebraically, one is simpler than the other. And so, when you look at it, you want to know. Do I scan X and calculate Y with the value of Y at which D, DX is zero? 
or do I scan y and calculate x? And so in this case, in this case, the null Klein calculation, where is my answer? The null Klein calculation is the following. And there it's a little bit, it's a little easier actually with the other one, but that's all right. And you'll see those here. So what is my A equation? DA by DT equals K1 A to the H. There are a lot of K as the exponents. K A to the H plus A to the H plus alpha B to the H. That's the activator. Minus K2 A. And I want this to be zero. That's what that would give me the A null point. When this is zero. Okay. So now I look at this thing and I either have to solve for B in terms of A or A in terms of B. And if I look at the structure of this mess, I say, boy, it's going to be a mess no matter what I do. But B only occurs once. So it's going to be easier to solve for B in terms of A than A in terms of B. So what do I do? I have zero equals K1 A to the H over K. I wish I could do some shorthand here because it's a lot of writing. A to the H plus alpha B to the H equals minus K2A. Okay, move K2A to the other side. May I do that without rewriting everything, save myself some trouble. Like this, I've got to get rid of B. So I multiply through, I have K A H plus A to the H plus alpha B to the H times K two A equals K one A to the H. I'm gonna clean that up. If I'm going too fast or make an algebra error, please tell me. All right. And now I just want to get B by itself. So to get B by itself, I multiply through by K2A or similar or easily or better, I just divide through by K2A. I divide through by K2A. And now I have this and this on this side. So I subtract those. So I do minus KA to the H minus A to the H. That gets rid of this. Alpha B to the H. So I have alpha B to the H. Let me clean this up. is equal to this. I divide by alpha. And now I have to take the end eighth, eighth, eighth root of it. So I have to take all of this and raise it to the one over h power. And that's b. So if I scan a with this formula, I get what B is for my null claim. Now there's one little trick that you have to watch out for, and that's why there's an extra line here with the word intermediate, which is if this argument is negative, H is a fractional power. And so Python actually is really nice. It will not, it will not crash. It will just warn you that you're generating an imaginary value. And so you'll get a warning message that you're taking a, 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 a root of, a, of a, a negative number. But to avoid that warning, I calculate this argument. If the argument is less than zero, I make it equal to zero, and then I take the root.
Okay. So the only thing that would change here in this whole thing to add that alpha is actually that I multiply all I'm doing actually is just dividing this whole thing by alpha. That's all. I'm so it actually is pretty easy. So I have to do that there and then this one also. Finding the fixed points, I'd have to do the same thing. But did that explain the null climb reasonably, reasonably clearly? Uh, yeah, I think so. So, I mean, you won't, it seems like you won't always be able to find an equation for that null climb then. Like, for example, in this, you can't see what it's like when alpha is equal to zero, right? So, right, yeah. So if 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 alpha is zero, it blows up. Um, and uh, because there because there's no because it doesn't depend on B anymore. So there is no null line anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, or it's actually, to be precise, the null line depends only on A. There's some value of A at which there's a zero, but it doesn't matter. So that's true. You could also have something, suppose that in the denominator, instead of alpha BH, I had something awful like alpha BH plus B, I don't know, B squared minus B to the fourth. Well, then I'd get some mess B, some mess of B here, and there wouldn't be any analytic way to reduce it. And then I'd have to solve it numerically. So, so if the if the functional form were a mess for both a and b, there's no simple way to write a in terms of b or b in terms of a. Then you're stuck. You have to do it numerically. Um, typically, I try to pick functional forms that are simple enough that you can do that by hand. But not it doesn't always work. But basically, the null lines are easy. the The fixed point is when both of these are zero. The null line is when either of them is zero. And I tried this on the memory circuit one. And for some reason, it didn't, the null line that I got analytically didn't work. I think there was some numerical problem that when I well, actually I know what happened. In the memory one, H was very big. It had H of 20. And the numerical 20th root didn't give us a didn't give a reasonable answer. You take you try, you take the 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 you know, in principle, the nth root of something is no big deal, but numerically, nth roots are not very accurate. And so that, that was not a good way to solve it. So the, the null lines that I got were bad, numerically bad. Because Weinberg didn't want to show that example. It's in the notebook and it gives the, the null clines are wrong. The, the phase plot's okay, but the okay. Did anybody get it? I've talked a lot, so we're now we're now out of time. Maybe I should do it. When I did an alpha of a small value, I got that the two loops kind of, and I did the recalculation of the null line. I got that the 
two little loops intersect with each other. So great. So that's what I wanted to see. Do you want to show us that? Sure. Taking a second to calculate there. Yeah, so now you've got two extra fixed points, right? Because mm -hmm. every time an alt line crosses another alt line, you've got an extra fixed point. And so now you've got something pretty interesting, which is you have the the one, two, three, you created two. So one of those is stable. So there actually now are, are four stable steady states. Uh, there's going to be zero, zero, high A, low B, high B, low A, and high A and high B. And the th key thing to notice is that when they're both high, that the values when they're both high are lower because both of them are fighting each other, but not fighting each other enough for one to win. Um, that's actually a pretty interesting, a pretty interesting case. And you'll notice that 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 if you look along the diagonal, let me do, let me annotate. I'll show. You. Let's see if I can annotate. You may have to enable annotation. You'll have to turn in in your Zoom. Turn on annotation, and then go back to the diagonal. So I'll, 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 that'll be the last thing. I'll talk. Thank you for pointing that out, Connor. I actually forgot to recalculate one of the null clines. No, you're good. Uh, I actually staring at it at first. I thought that it was just because the the x and y um, axes are stretched differently. Um, so I wasn't even sure if that was it. There yeah, there you go. They should be they should be symmetric. Um, now that looks yeah that looks better. There we go. Um, I. I, I was wondering if there were brown. Okay. So could you just turn on annotation for a second? You have to go in the zoom three dots and say enable annotation value. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, so so here, this guy is still stable. You see the arrows point towards it. These guys, the green ones here, are still stable. The arrows point towards them. But now you get two new fixed points. You get this fixed point here and this fixed point here. Before, when I came in along the diagonal, I always came to zero. And now I've created two new fixed points along my diagonal. This one here is unstable. If I could move a little bit this way, I go to this value. If I move a little bit this way, I go to this value. If I move a little bit this way, I go to this value. And now there's a new stable fixed point here. There's a new stable fixed point here. At a new unstable fixed point here. And you'll notice that this stable one, the value of x is a little bit less than if it's by x is by itself, the value of y is a little bit less than by itself. And so now you have you have that extra state. So you get these two extra states. And that's, a, that's actually a, a better problem. That's actually a more interesting homework problem than the one that I see. So that's pretty nice. And what you'll see happen is you change the value. As you increase the value of, of alpha, uh, these, this point will move this way, this point will move this way, they'll collide and disappear, and then we get the separation. And that's great. So, so, Thank you very much, everybody, for being willing to, to try this out.
Does anybody else have anything they want to add tonight? We've had a, been sort of an exploratory class, but I hope that was interesting. Did anybody try changing the value just of one of those Ks? Should I just change the value of K2? Maybe quickly do that before yeah, we Yeah, I changed the value of K1 to double of its size without changing anything else. And uh, they cross together like very similar to what we're seeing here. But, your, but K1 is symmetrical, right? It, it changes both equations at once. It's true. So, so K2 and K3, if you change the ratio of K2 and K3, then it's not symmetrical anymore. One of them dominates the other. So that might be something to try as a little homework exercise. Okay, well, it's, we're over time a bit. I want to thank everybody for being willing to try this out. And I, I realize we, we jumped into sort of into the middle of, of dynamical systems theory. Uh, the, there is a, an introduction to it in chapters 13 to 14 in Herbert's textbook. And I also, the, in the email, I sent some, some, uh, some links to, to other places you could look. That textbook that I recommended, um, the, the Essential Mathematical Biology, has a sort of a general introduction to it. And there are plenty of places. Uh, Connor has this nice textbook that he likes that I think I mentioned at the beginning of the class. It's a very good place to learn this too. Okay, well, thank you. So next week, Juliano, what was the decision about in-person versus online versus split for next week? It's going to be hybrid as usual. Um, enough people want to be in-person for the in-person version to be viable and a lot of people also want to be online. So business as usual, just without YouTube. Okay, so so the only thing about next week is that you you, you have to listen to it and that it's gone. I guess. I guess we could probably, yeah, you know, they all our recorders. Yeah, we can put it on Canvas, but. Hmm. So why don't you make a private recording, but we won't share it unless it's going to be specifically asked for. Yep. And are you going to be presenting and uploading to NanoHub too? Yes, the plan is to do presenting, uh, uploading to NanoHub, a bit of widgets if I have time and then they'll take it. So that part you should probably stream. Yes, yeah. Or don't, if you don't stream, just record it and I can upload it to, to YouTube, et cetera. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that's safer. That, that, then they'll feel more secure, so it's not, yep. there's no chance of it. Okay, great. Well, uh, I hope it goes really well next week for everybody. I, have, I hope people's projects are coming along. I hope these little methods that we're talking about here may give people's ideas about projects too, about how to do analysis, how to about think about problems. I wish I had a, I wish I had a text sort of a sing, a sync a single workflow that works for all problems, and I don't. But I thought maybe by exploring a couple of different problems, that's sort of a slightly more systematic way of thinking about them, we might be able to learn how to explore problems together.